This video is sponsored by Normandy 1998, Ash and Team Valor. Following the declaration of rivalry, Misty and Serena resume chatting amiably, as while the Wallace Cup is important to them, they have no interest in ruining their friendship over it. Being curious as to what she's been up to since they parted ways, the group follow Misty up to her room so they can continue talking, with the girl explaining she's been travelling around Kanto in the hopes of learning more about water Pokemon, having even spent some time in the Sevi Islands, as while they are part of the region, they have many species of Pokemon not native to mainland Kanto. One new catch is fast asleep in Misty's bed when the group arrive, though this is brought to an abrupt halt when Ash loudly asks what it is, causing it to wake and start crying. As he is shot reproachful looks by both Brock and Misty, the latter of whom rushes in to comfort her seemingly very young Pokemon, she explains that it's called Togepi, and she found its egg not too long ago in a place called Grandpa Canyon. Wanting to help calm Togepi down, Serena brings forth Quaxley. Since being of a similar age, she hopes they might be able to play together, with this being a wise decision as the two juvenile Pokemon become fast friends. Wanting to make up for his prior mistake, Ash then takes up the role of storyteller, recounting their journey, including his brief trip to Carlos, though Misty mostly just wants to hear about his Kingler, as its incredible strength in the face of steep opposition is just further proof that water types are the best. Grinning, Ash replies that yeah, his Kingler is awesome, even calling it forth so Misty can meet it, while in turn Ash, Brock, Lissy, and Serena get to meet the rest of Misty's team, which includes her Staryu, Stami, and Goldeen, along with some additions in Corsola and Tentacruel, the former of whom Serena beams is adorable, while Lissy admits herself more partial to the latter, as having grown up around water types, she respects the effort Misty's put into making Tentacruel's head gems live up to their reputation as the jewels of the sea. This goes on until Brock makes the point they should probably head to bed soon, since both Misty and Serena will have to be up bright and early tomorrow, while Lissy will have to be gone even earlier considering she needs to meet up with her fellow judges before the cup. Taking this to heart, the friends all bid each other good night and return to their respective rooms, eager to get some rest. Meanwhile, having camped out in the bushes just outside the centre, Team Rocket are hard at work hatching their own plan, as while well, Jesse had always intended to enter the Wallace Cup, upon seeing the silhouettes of Misty's rare Pokemon through the curtains, she is now determined to steal them. Unfortunately, as Meowth points out, there's one problem. They don't have any Water-type Pokémon, and while that's not a rule per se, he's got to imagine Waterboy Wallace is going to favour them, so they won't get far without one. However, here Jessie adopts an evil grin, saying that she has an answer to that. Then, as she advances on the Scratch Cat, he wonders if perhaps things were better when he couldn't speak. The next morning, as promised, Lissy is already gone by the time Ash, Misty, and Serena come down for breakfast. Though when they arrive, they're surprised to see Brock is not alone, as across from him sits none other than Professor Oak, with a pair chatting amiably over some tea and crackers. At the sight of Ash and Serena, Oak greets them warmly, asking how they are, while Pikachu and Eevee leap happily into the man's lap, where they receive pats and scratches behind the ears. Taking their seats across from him, Ash and Serena grin that they've been good, while introducing Misty, and in turn asking what Oak is doing here, smiling, the Professor replies that he's actually a big fan of Pokemon contests, as they're a showcase of how well a trainer is raised and bonded with their Pokemon, and while he cannot afford to leave the lab to watch every contest in person, the Wallace Cup is a special exception, especially since it hasn't been hosted in Kanto for many years. This makes Serena in particular smile, as she states that she hopes Oak will be rooting for her, with a sandy-haired scientist replying that he certainly will, which reminds him, a while back, she asked him to look into a golden tackle attack, and after some research into Pokemon moves forgotten to time, he found what he believes to be the answer, a move called VV Volley, which is only accessible by a certain special subspecies of Eevee long thought to be extinct. At once, all of Serena's friends congratulate her and Eevee on this discovery, though smiling fondly as her starter leaps from Oak's lap into hers, Serena replies that she always knew Eevee was special, even without rare moves. Following this touching display, the group including Professor Oak make their way over to the Cerulean Gym, which has been done up for the occasion, with a large floating stage being positioned in the centre of the pool, while at the far end, Daisy, Lily, Violet, Lycia and Wallace all sit, with Wallace smiling and waving to the audience as they arrive. It is here the girls say their goodbyes, going backstage and watching as the first appeal begins. Surprisingly, this contestant is another familiar face, that being Erica, who goes against type by using her gloom in this water-themed contest. However, showing the same poison in ingenuity she did during their meeting. She uses her grass types to effectively show how water nourishes plants to make them stronger and more beautiful, earning her high marks and starting the cup off strong. From here, several more competitors take their turns, with most using water types as one would expect of a contest bearing the name of the world's greatest water type specialist. But to Serena's astonishment, when Misty's turn comes, she follows in Erica's footsteps, as despite being a water trainer, her choice is none other than Togepi. Placing the spiky ball of joy down on the platform, the redhead then encourages to just go have fun, with it immediately beginning to dance happily as Misty claps along. 
Soon the crowd begin clapping in unison, clearly loving the happy dance. All the while, the little egg's hands begin to glow as they sway back and forth like a metronome. Then suddenly, geysers of water begin erupting out of the pool in a powerful demonstration of water sport, showing that luck must be on Misty's side to have gotten what is probably the best possible outcome, with a rainbow forming above her and Togepi's heads to finish off the appeal. Unsurprisingly, such overt cuteness earns the pair high marks, with Togepi leaping happily into Misty's arms for a cuddle as she spins it round, cheering that it did great. Returning backstage, Misty is met with praise from Serena, who calls her performance inspired, though in truth she's a little worried, since she had planned to have Quaxley perform a dance routine for their appeal, which means now she needs to think up a new plan on the fly. Suddenly, the other appeals which had seemed to drag on wrap up in the blink of an eye, so that before she knows it, Serena and Quaxley are out on stage. From the audience, Ash, Brock and Oak cheer for her, and as she makes eye contact with Lissy at the judges' table, the teal head girl gives her rival the smallest of confident nods, urging her to knock everyone's socks off. Taking a deep breath, Serena tells Quaxley to begin the dance routine they had practiced, with a beginning with a flamenco twirl as it begins swaying its way across the stage. Though when it draws near to the water, Serena urges it to keep going, having it dive deep then re-emerge with a flourish, as it uses the spin to launch a 360 degree aqua cutter, which is able to slice through the droplets in mid-air, creating a shower of diamond dust, while also wowing the audience and judges alike with their precision. Next up, Serena has her duckling use pound on the air beneath it, causing it to spring upwards into the air, allowing it to spread its wings and remind everyone that while it is a water type, it is also a bird. Though it is still too young and small to propel itself upwards with flight, it can at least glide, soaring above the audience as it circles the pool, before finally coming in for a landing on Serena's outstretched hand, ending the appeal by mirroring its trainer and extending a wing, so that both coordinator and Pokemon are able to perfectly match each other as they bow with flourish. This showing goes a long way to impress the judges, with Serena being pleased to see her points between Erica's and Misty's. Taking this as a good sign, she heads backstage to unwind, while taking her place as the final coordinator of the day, Jess Aqua, and her amazing juggling doo Naturally, this is just Jessie and Meowth, the latter of whom had been unwillingly painted blue, squeezed into a dark blue speedo and decked out with a pair of fake scout chops, which she awkwardly begins to juggle while capering back and forth and whistling circus music. While not as impressive as the other performances, it is just goofy enough to go from pathetic to amusing, so that when the finalists are announced, Jess Aqua slides in at spot 16. Meanwhile, Serena, Misty and Erica are also moving on, with the trio and Jessie all breezing through their first two matches and making it to the semis. Here Misty is matched up with Erica, while Serena gets Jessie as her opponent, causing the three good guys to all wish each other luck and praise the others for their impressive displays they've put on so far, while from the side, Jessie sneers they can play cheerleader for each other all they want, since in the end, her enormous talent is going to crush all three of them and win her the Aqua Ribbon. Scowling that nobody asked her, Misty storms past Jessie to take the stage. Stage, or with a polite nod to the rude woman, Erica does likewise, ready to begin their match. As expected, Erica goes with a grass type, this time choosing her Leafeon, while in turn Misty makes the smart decision of picking Tentacruel, as not only does its poison typing mitigate its critical weakness to grass moves, but by virtue of being an aquatic creature, it can make use of the gym's pool in a way that Erica's Pokemon cannot. It is a clever strategy, though one more suited for a conventional battle than a contest one, as due to being partially submerged and away from the stage, there is no much can to take points from Erica, while well, in contrast, the Celadon Gym Leader makes great use of her free run of the stage, opening with Sunny Day, which not only looks gorgeous, but also significantly weakens Tentacruel, while boosting Leafeon's speed due to Chlorophyll. It is a tactical and well thought out opening move that reminds Misty why Erica is so highly esteemed as both a trainer and coordinator. Then, to make matters worse, Leafeon begins making waves for Tentacruel, quite literally in fact, as by using the secondary effect of Sunny Day, the Grass Fox manifests a large solar beam which it fires into the pool, causing the water to rise and evaporate, while sending Tentacruel crashing onto the field. This does some serious damage both to the water type and its trainer's points. Though spunky and tenacious as ever, Misty has Tentacruel stand up on its tentacles and lash out at Leafeon with Poison Jab. However, once again Leafeon has the advantage, as with its boosted speed it easily dodges every jab, bringing Misty to the verge of defeat, while the only points Erica has lost come from the evident strength of Tentacruel's move. Seeing a chance to end things, Erica then calls for Giga Drain, having the tendrils of green energy swirl around her Pokemon dramatically before latching themselves on a Tentacruel. Though, here something strange happens, as without warning, an inky purple colour begins leaking into the energy vines, dyeing them the same hue and leaving Leafeon looking rather queasy. From the stands, Professor Oak muses that Misty's Tentacruel must have liquid bodies as its ability, which means Leafeon is in serious trouble. 
a fact which becomes evident when Misty next has Tenacru use Poison Jab, as the fox is too wobbly on its feet to dodge even with its speed boost, taking the super effective hit and skidding to a stop at Erica's feet. Recognizing that Leafeon is on its last legs, the gym leader has her friend gamble everything on one final attack by unleashing another instantly charged solar beam, though in its weakened state, this blast is nothing to what it previously was, with Misty making the audacious call not to have Tenacru dodge, but instead to deliver a downward chop with one of its tentacles at the last second, slicing the blast in half so that it passes harmlessly around the water type, in such an awe-inspiring display of power that it comes as no shock when the rest of Erica's points drain away, giving Misty a comeback win that none here will forget. When their Pokemon are returned, the two young women meet in the center of the field, shaking hands and thanking each other for a great match. In a modest voice, Erica tells Misty that she learned a lot about battling water types, so for that she's grateful, but with a smile, Misty replies she feels she's learned a lot too about how to battle with confidence and poise like Erica does, vowing to adapt this into her own battle style, making her a true water flower. In contrast, the following match is not nearly so amiable, as once again, Jessie uses her quote unquote do what, this time against Serena's Eevee, with the fox opening the battle by employing a speedy double kick, meant to show off its agility and power. Knowing this will be super effective against him, Meowth hastily brings up a scout chop to block, though unfortunately, these weapons are made of little more than paper mache, with the first kick tearing right through it, before the second catches the cat in the jaw, and sends him splashing into the water. This is is where things go from bad to worse, as in his panicked scramble to return to the stage, Meowth howls that he hates water, not only revealing that he can talk, but that he is definitely not a do-what. This is only further compounded by the fact that when Meowth emerges from the pool, most of his makeup is washed off, showing him for who he is. Seeing this, Jesse screams into the crowd, lambasting James for not getting the waterproof makeup, to which the blue-haired man awkwardly admits that he was trying to cut costs, and he didn't think Meowth would willingly go in the water, so it didn't seem like an issue. By now it is become abundantly clear to Serena who she is battling, with the same being true for Lycia, Daisy, Violet and Lily, the latter three of whom still remember when the crooks broke into this very gym and tried to rob it. To this end, they immediately call for Jess Aqua's disqualification, with Wallace trusting his niece and so officially removing Jessie from the running. Unfortunately, this only incenses the magenta haired woman more, as she orders Meowth and James to help her steal every Pokemon here, since if she can't win the ribbon, that'll make a pretty good consolation prize. At once the team of crooks then resort to their backup plan, with Meowth pressing a button which sees a large mech buster hole in the wall, before pointing its hose arm in the direction of the audience and coordinators and beginning to suck. As the closest one to the machine, Serena's Pokemon are the first to be taken, as while she wraps her arms around Eevee to protect it, this leaves no hands free to catch Haunter, Butterfree and Quaxley's balls which vanish into the sinister tube. Likewise, many other trainers soon find themselves bereft of Pokeballs, while Team Rocket cackle with glee as they leap into the cockpit and begin complimenting themselves on this being the most ingenious scheme ever. From the crowd, Ash cries out to Brock and Oak that they've got to stop Team Rocket before they steal every Pokemon in the gym, though it seems their assistance will not be necessary after all, as rising to his feet and tossing aside his cape with a flourish, Wallace declares that he will not allow these thieves to defile his cup. Calling forth his partner in Milotic, Wallace then demonstrates the true power of a champion and contest master, as in a flash, the water serpent uses Dragon Tail to sever the mech's vacuum hand, halting the theft, before following up with an ice beam to its feet preventing any chance of a getaway. In an attempt to quit while they're ahead, Team Rocket then each grab a sack of Pokeballs and try to escape on foot, though this is a big mistake, as having no glass to shield them anymore, Pikachu deftly strikes the trio with a powerful thunderbolt which staggers them, while Serena is the closest trainer still with a Pokemon commands Eevee to use VV Volley. This use of its proper name for the first time seems to give the move additional power, with the golden aura growing larger than before as Eevee bounds forward and pinballs between the team of troublemakers, striking them each in the face they are sent blasting off, while their ill-gotten sacks drop to the ground allowing their rightful trainers to rush up and retrieve the Pokemon inside. As Serena does this, she notices something odd about one of her Pokeballs, though dismissing it for the time being, she instead returns to the field for a faded match with Misty. Following a brief recess to ensure that everyone has gotten their Pokemon back and that no one is hurt, Wallace calls for the finals to begin, with this seeing Serena and Misty sharing matching smiles as they wish each other luck and reassert their promise from the previous night. Then, when the starting bell sounds, Misty brings forth her Starmie, a choice that gives Serena pause, as this is the Pokemon who beat Ash back in Rota despite having a type disadvantage. Nonetheless, she's come too far to give up at the final hurdle, and so gripping her Pokeball tight, she calls forth Haunter, since as the part psychic type, Starmie will be weak to its ghost type moves, only to be met with the unfamiliar countenance of a Gengar. For a moment, 
moment. Serena wonders if this is some shape-shifting trick from a prankster Pokemon. Though when Gengar cries out his name with pride and determination, she realizes that this must be real, even if she is a loss as to how this evolution happened. However, choosing not to look a gift ponytail in the mouth, she instead prepares to call her first move. Though it seems in this she is too slow, as being an aggressive battler, Misty strikes first, ordering Starmie to fire off a psychic. At once, a pulse of psionic energy rocks the battlefield, making the hairs on the back of Serena's neck stand up, while poor Gengar takes an even more intense blast of energy thanks to being weak to the typing. Though even still, the spectre stays strong, flashing its trainer a thumbs up that says it's okay. Thanks to this quick recovery, both coordinators points take a hit, though Serena's loss is greater, with Misty wanting to capitalize on this lead, as well as to show off a bit to Wallace. To this end, she next calls for a hydro pump, though here Serena has a solution, having her playful poltergeist open its mouth wide and begin comedically drinking the water, while swelling cartoonishly as it does. This counter takes a hefty chunk out of Misty's points, though proving herself the more experienced battler, the young redhead decides to combine moves, having Starmie fire a thunderbolt out of another limb, with it traveling along the hydro pump and right into Gengar's open mouth, causing it to briefly light up while giving an x-ray view of its skeleton before crashing to its back with a sigh. Seeing an opening, Misty then has Starmie blast Gengar with another psychic, with this two dealing super effective damage, while up on the clock more than half of the time limit has elapsed, with Serena being notably behind. Urgently, the Closian girl calls to Gengar to get up, and hearing the sound of a friend in need, the ghost type for once in its afterlife grows serious, rising high into the air, and with a menacing glare truly worthy of a type associated with death, manifests a large shadow ball that seems to dim the very lights of the gym so that soon the battlefield has descended into a twilight gloom. In this environment, Gengar is at its most powerful, with the shadow ball growing to almost ten times the size of Gengar itself so that when it is thrown down at Starmie, the mysterious Pokemon has to use all its psychic power to hold the orb in place. However, such a tactic significantly limits its focus, and as any good prankster knows, the key to a good practical joke is the element of surprise. Capitalizing on this, Gengar allows itself to fade into the now vastly more present shadows before appearing right behind Starmie, though it does not strike yet. As being a showman through and through, it makes a big display of drawing out the wooden mallet from its mouth. Then, when it has its prop in hand, it makes its move, choosing not to attack, but rather to startle the star with a light tap on its shoulder. Jumping in fright and breaking its concentration, Starmie turns to face its foe, only to receive a surprise uppercut from the mallet, which sends it flying into the air as the giant shadow ball descends. Unsurprisingly, this results in a painful collision with the orb erupting in what can only be called evil fireworks, the likes of which not only sap all of Starmie's strength, but also the remainder of Misty's points, so that as the starfish hits the ground, it is to the sound of thunderous applause as a new Wallace Cup winner is crowned. Drifting onto the stage in Milotic's back, Wallace then personally presents Serena with the Aqua Ribbon, smiling that she and her Pokemon more than earned it, with this causing renewed cheers to fill the gym though none cheer louder than Ash, Brock, and Lycia. That evening, the team all gather in the Pokemon Center to celebrate the day's events, with everyone raising a glass to Serena, as she alongside Lycia has now secured a place in the Grand Festival. Even Misty has nothing but praise for her finals opponent, saying that she truly earned that ribbon, though promises that next time they battle, it'll be in the League format, which means she'll definitely win. From behind her, a voice then asks if she is not a coordinator by trade, since she was quite adept at contest battling with the kids all turning to see Wallace flanked by Professor Oak. A little starstruck, Misty admits that she's actually not a coordinator, and that she entered the cup to meet him, since she wants to be a water-type master just like Wallace. Smiling softly, Wallace replies that he is touched by her admiration, before commenting that he was quite impressed by her water-types, not to mention all that Lycia and Misty's sisters told him about her. So, if she would be interested, he'd like to offer her a place as his disciple, just as he was to the gym leader and former contest master Wong. Truthfully, Misty's unsure what is more of a shock, this offer or that her sisters actually said something nice about her, though since this is exactly what she wanted, she eagerly nods, with Wallace stating they leave tomorrow, so she had best sleep well as they will be training all the way back to Hoenn. He then adds his own congratulations to Serena, calling her a star in the making, as well as wishing Lycia luck in her upcoming championship events, before swanning away, leaving just the professor. For his part, he wishes to invite Ashbrock, Serena and Lycia to come back to Pallet Town with him, since as it stands, the Grand Festival and Indigo League are only a few weeks away, meaning the time for training is rapidly running out. And that's where we'll leave things. Why did Haunter suddenly evolve into Gengar? What training will our heroes undertake back in Pallet Town? 
and how will they fare now that they've reached the point they've striven so hard for? Find out as the journey continues.